Welcome everyone to the Kimberlite webinar to take a comprehensive look at the big four oil field service suppliers. My name is David Batt. I'm the president of Kimberlite Research and I'm glad that you're able to join us today. This is the 24th Kimberlite webinar series that we're conducting today. And we host these on behalf of the oil and gas operators who participate in our industry research. Our past webinars have included reviews of many of the oil field products and services most commonly used in the industry, such as drilling services, hydraulic fracturing, artificial lift, formation evaluation, cementing surface wall heads, subsea and pipeline inspection. Let us know if any of you, if you or any of your colleagues need access to these webinars and send us an email or a chat message and we'll connect you up with those prior webinars. Today, we'll be focusing a deep dive into the supplier performance and the competitive positioning of the big four oil field service providers, both globally as well as in the Permian Basin. Today's overview will assess the competitive landscape of how these suppliers stack up in terms of overall performance and service quality, and we'll look at various uh, geographies as well. Please feel free to submit questions that you may have in the chat box, or you can email them to us at Kimberlite Research. We'll address your questions as we go along. Um, for those of you that are not that familiar with Kimberlite Research, I will provide a, a brief background and then dive into the review. Um, each year, Kimberlite Research conducts about 3,000 one-on-one -on -one interviews with oil field service customers globally each year. Uh, many of you on the webinar may have participated in one of our prior industry studies. And for that, we thank you for your participation. Over the most recent years, we've interviewed over 17,000 users of oil field services, and we built a whole series of reports uh, addressing formation evaluation, drilling, completion, production, and subsea. Today, the interviews and the results that we'll be presenting to you are based on over 17,000 interviews with oil and gas customers. The data set is fairly rich and, and multidimensional, and, we'll, and we, in, the, in this particular exhibit, we cross plot supplier performance on the x-axis against supplier pricing competitiveness on the y-axis. And this quadrant map or value map is an exhibit that we'll be using extensively today. So before we dive in, I want to make sure everyone understands the four quadrants. Any oil field service company supplier that plots in the top right-hand quadrant is viewed as a premium supplier. Their performance is better than industry average. The pricing may be a little bit higher than industry norm. They cost more, but they're worth it, and they're a premium supplier. The fair value fairway runs diagonally down to the southwest corner here, the discount quadrant. Any suppliers, oil field service company suppliers that plot in the bottom left-hand quadrant are viewed as a discount provider. They charge a lower price. They don't perform necessarily uh, as an industry leader, but they deliver good value and you get what you pay for as an oil and gas operator. Any oil field service company suppliers in the bottom right are viewed as value advantaged and top left are value disadvantaged. So as an oil company, um, naturally you're looking for good value. And so you're looking for oil field service company suppliers that can either perform on par with industry norm or better than industry norm or deliver good value for what they deliver as a discount provider. So with that, why don't we go ahead and dive in. I think maybe the first thing we should maybe touch on is just a quick overview of the projections for 2023. Overall, based on um, interviews with oil and gas operators globally, we see a globally coordinated uplift with plans to drill about 14.2% more wells globally in 23 versus 22. We see both international, offshore, and U.S. land all kind of pointed in the same double-digit direction. This is obviously going to continue to place some strains on the oil field services capacity. But 2022 is probably the most straining of all, particularly in U.S. land. So I think the worst is behind us. If you take a look at the sentiment indices, you can see we just traveled unsustainable and historic lows in 2020. We've seen unsustainable and historic highs uh, a year following, and now we're just moderating off these historic highs. But overall, uh, the market's very robust going into 2023. I, I talked about 22 was a very challenging year uh, for U.S. land in particular. 
Um, even though we're only going to drill about 15% more wells in U.S. land in 23 versus 22, we just came off of a year of drilling 40% more wells. And this really put a, 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 a massive strain on supply chains and oil field service capacity. And we can talk more about that too later in, in a little bit. And one more thing I'd like to update you on is ESG and digital trends. Uh, when we conduct our interviews, and many of you on the call here today may have participated in our industry surveys, regardless if we're talking to geologists, drill engineers, completion engineers, production or subsea engineers, we'll ask questions about operators' plans for ESG investment. And what we find is ESG investment still remains strong with about 52% of operators globally planning to increase their ESG expenditures in the 23 another 46% planning to keep their ESG expenditures uh, flat with prior year. Most of the ESG focus and spending is around emissions reduction and monitoring and reduction of flaring, followed by carbon capture. When we ask the oil and gas operators which oil field service provider is best able to help them to achieve their ESG objectives, and this is an open-ended, unaided question, we find that SLB is cited uh, nearly at a three to one ratio over Halliburton and Baker Hughes as that supplier best able to help the operators meet their ESG objectives. In terms of new energy investment, we find that carbon capture is number one, obviously with the enhanced 45Q tax credits from the Inflation Reduction Act, a commercial model clearly exists for carbon capture, but we also find that operators have interest in plans to invest in geothermal, hydrogen, and wind, and we track this. So if you have any questions, let us know. We also track the impacts of digitization, machine learning, and remote operations. Digital investment continues to grow, mostly, you know, obviously led by the major oil companies, with plans and expectations that increased investments in digitization will yield many benefits with respect to data analysis to help support production and drilling operations and optimization and real-time monitoring. Remote operations is also another critical area of investment that's continuing to grow post-COVID as it's viewed as uh, being able to make better decisions and, and drill and operate more efficiently. Offshore, it reduces personnel reduction. Onshore, personnel reduction is a factor, but not so much as the efficiencies derived. So with that, let's dive into the overview of the major oil field service companies. And let's first, first start out regionally. When you take a look at the North America land market and you take a look at this value map or competitive landscape that I described a few minutes ago, what we find is that the, the big three service providers, SLB, Halliburton, and Baker Hughes, are competitively disadvantaged to the many small and mid-tier oil field service providers that we aggregate together as all others. Uh, Weatherford's probably the closest to delivering close to good value amongst the big four. If you dive into the Permian Basin a little bit more specifically, these small and mid-tier oil field service providers in aggregate comprise nearly 75% market share. And so you can see what's been transpiring in the Permian Basin as well as in North America land. You know, the market shares for SLB, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, and Weatherford have been kind of declining because uh, they're competitively disadvantaged in the eyes of the oil and gas operators that are rating their performance. To look at this a little bit more carefully, if you look at the supplier performance trends in the middle part of the screen, you can see the industry average dash line improving where all the industry ratings and performance reviews were improving from 2018 to 21. The performance measures that we're measuring here on the middle part of the screen are equipment quality, product quality, technical support, competency of field service personnel, responsiveness to customer needs, availability and operational advantages, uh, efficiency in the field, uh, reduction of non-productive time. What you see here is from 21 to 22, you see that the performance review ratings from the oil and gas operators have been collected down from 21 to 22. As I mentioned earlier, when you drill 40% more wells in a given year and you're having to staff up with thousands of new employees across drilling, completion, production, artificial lift, and trying to reach those competencies, it's very clear that the oil and gas operators are seeing a decline in the performance of all the oil field service companies. In fact, you can see Halliburton, Baker Hughes, Weatherford, and SLB all declining. They all have customer review ratings practically every survey year that are below the industry average. And these small to mid-tier suppliers are consistently getting ratings that are better than the industry average. 
So it should be to no surprise that these small to mid-tier oil field service companies in aggregate are viewed as delivering values in the North America land uh, market as well as the Permian Basin market. Um, let's go ahead and jump ahead here. If you take a look into the North America land market really quick, what we find is that there's a diverse group of needs of operators. Some oil companies, operators in North America land, really rely on and desire to get best price, and they really heavily use price in their recommendation and use of a supplier. Other oil and gas operators in North America land most highly value access to quality service or to technology and their recommendation and use of a supplier. You can see amongst all three buying groups, the small to mid-tier suppliers, all others, tend to be viewed as delivering the best overall value. You also see amongst those oil, oil companies and operators that most highly value service, that's where some of the big three, big four suppliers become more competitive. The competitive landscape changes quite a bit as you move internationally. Because when you move internationally here and looking at international land, you see differentiated value. You see Schlumberger, SLB up here in the premium quadrant as the premium based supplier, cost more than worth it. You have Halliburton and Baker in the middle. You've got Weatherford down here as a discount provider, along with the small to mid tier suppliers. But look what you see different internationally versus North America land. These small to mid tier providers, oil field service company providers, in the international land market, there are units performing below industry average and more in the discount quadrant. Whereas what we just saw before in North America land, these small to mid-tier oil field service companies perform better than industry average and we're in the value advantage quadrant. So we clearly see some differentiation in international land. If you go to the Middle East, you see even greater differentiation of uh, uh, value differ differentiation, pay more, get more with SLB pay less, get less with some of these discount providers. But in all cases, the operators are seeing good value or appropriate value um, amongst the operators. So this is a very good sign to see in the Middle East and international land. You'll also notice that when you move in the international markets, you'll find that now SLB is consistently receiving customer review ratings that are higher than industry average. You also see the inflection of the performance ratings from 21 to 22, again, reflecting the strains that we've had in the industry as we go back to work and picking up investment activity, how hard it is to get the consistency and competencies of, uh, of performance that we're seeking in the marketplace. We also find that in the international market that the operators tend to value most heavily access to technology and, and strong performance. In, in the selection and recommendation of a supplier. Schlumberger is viewed very favorably among operators that most heavily value technology and performance, as well as access to quality service. You can see that Schlumberger is competitively disadvantaged internationally by those international oil and gas operators that most heavily value price and their recommendation and use of a supplier. You can see that uh, Baker Hughes, Halliburton, and Weatherford are also uh, favorably viewed as good values amongst these uh, various buying groups. When you move offshore, you see, again, you see differentiated value, again, with Schlumberger, SLB, in the premium quadrant. You see Halliburton and Baker Hughes viewed in the middle as delivering good value, and you see Weatherford down here as a discount uh, provider. Again, you see SLB getting the highest supplier performance review ratings in the offshore uh, market. They also are viewed as being the most expensive, and they get the lowest ratings on a scale of 1 to 10 on pricing competitiveness. Let's transition gears really quick, and I'm going to make one observation that we've noticed in a tightening market, and then we're going to take a deeper dive into the big four. If you take a look at the major oil companies and the national oil companies and where they place some of their greatest emphasis and the recommendation and use of suppliers. And you see how this has changed in their buying behaviors from 2020 to 2022. In a tightening oil field services market, we notice that the major oil companies are placing less emphasis on price and more emphasis on access to quality service, followed by technology. 
and the national oil companies, particularly the tier ones, are, are really emphasizing access to technology in their selection and recommendation uh, of suppliers. You've seen this manifested lately as many of these major oil companies and national oil companies have leaned forward over the past six months and leaned in, if you will, in signing long-term agreements uh, with oil for the service providers in order to have access to the equipment that they need to meet their investment goals. I really highly um, encourage the collaboration, if you will, between the oil and gas operators and the oil flow service companies, the oil flow service partners, if you will, because in, in a world where we have constrained access and, and to equipment and, and qualified people and, and qualified equipment, in a world of capital discipline where both operators and service providers are committed to generating sufficient uh, investor returns, we're going to need to work together to ensure that our supply of qualified equipment and people are lining up appropriately with the plans of the operators. And this is going to require some planning and some uh, collaboration. Let's take a look at Baker Hughes. When you take a look at Baker Hughes enterprise-wide across OFS and OFE, uh, what we find is that Baker Hughes is ex exhibiting some competitive vulnerabilities in the U.S. land market, which I, I showed earlier when we showed the North America landslides. And we see that when you move internationally into many of the other regions, they're right in the middle of the fair value fairway here. So they're very well positioned. They're, they're viewed as performing either on par with industry average or industry norm or slightly below. But in, in, in just about all the regions, uh, Baker Hughes is viewed as delivering a good value. If you compare Baker Hughes on the left to SLB on the right, you can see that SLB also is competitively challenged in the North America market, but internationally they're very solidly positioned into the cost market working quadrant. If you take a look at Baker Hughes by individual product line, you see there's a dispersion pattern where you know, some of the product lines where Baker Hughes' performance is probably uh, underperforming the greatest tends to be more in the OFB sectors of subsea equipment and, 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 sub and surface wellheads, but also wireline perforating. You also see very uh, a lot of their strengths with Baker Hughes around drilling services and ESPs, even strong value in formation evaluation with LWD and wireline logging. If you take a look at Baker Hughes in the Permian Basin, you can see that Baker Hughes does exhibit some competitive vulnerabilities with several of their product lines in which the oil and gas operators are questioning the value proposition that they're receiving from Baker Hughes with these particular product lines. In the Permian Basin, Baker Hughes is viewed as performing strongest with drill bits and ESPs and delivering good value for wireline logging. If you move to the Middle East, you see the dispersion tighten up quite a bit near the fair value fairway, illustrating how Baker Hughes's performance in the Middle East across their array of product lines is, is much stronger and more consistent, and they're delivering a much more consistent value proposition to the oil and gas operators in the Middle East, whereas in the Permian Basin, we, we see that being challenged a, a bit more. Um, let's go ahead and jump ahead to Halliburton. If you take a look at Halliburton across their portfolio of product lines, we see something somewhat similar to Baker Hughes in that they too exhibit some competitive vulnerability in U.S. land, but there's some differences with Halliburton. Um, they're viewed as delivering very strong value in the Gulf of Mexico, in West Africa, and many of the other regions, uh, they're similar to Baker Hughes. They're not necessarily viewed as a performance leader, but delivering uh, fairly good value in those regions. If you compare Halliburton on the left to SLB on the right, again, you see the, 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 the difference between SLB being a premium supplier in the international markets over here and Halliburton trying to be more of a, a lower-priced value-based alternative to SLB, who's the performance leader internationally. By product line, again, on a global worldwide basis, you see that Halliburton, too, has a dispersion pattern and you can see where they have some of their strengths with completions and fluids and ESP. Hydraulic fracturing services is really kind of in profit optimization mode and deriving um, you know, a focus on, on return to shareholders 
from a pricing strategy perspective. And wireline logging um, is one along with sperry bits, uh, sperry drill bits and mud motors and MWD, rotary steerables. It's the sperry drilling services product line that tends to underperform uh, on a global basis. If you look at Halliburton in the Permian Basin, again, you see a dispersion pattern that's reminiscent of kind of what we saw with Baker Hughes, where there are several product lines whose value propositions are being challenged, but many other product lines where they're viewed as delivering good value, such as barrel drilling fluids, cementing tools. Um, and, he, and Sperry has really kind of focused, uh, you know, where they wish to apply their drilling technologies in the U.S. land in the Permian Basin. And they seem to have aligned up well with applications and operators uh, where they can be viewed as delivering very good value for, uh, for their drilling services um, in, in U.S. land and the Permian Basin. Halliburton II also shows a nice con a consistency of performance in the Middle East. Uh, certainly, um, they are showing some product lines whose value propositions and performance profiles are being challenged, but many other product lines you can see from fluids and completions where they're viewed very favorably. If we jump ahead here and take a look at SLB, I think we've uh, taken a really good look here um, in terms of looking at, at Schlumberger or SLB um, with respect to the fact that they are viewed as a premium-based supplier internationally, but they too are being challenged in North America. And you see SLB respond uh, in a number of ways in order to participate in North America, oftentimes through channel partners, through their extreme um, channel of distribution for drilling services or, or partnering with edge mud logging for mud logging. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're taking to different approaches. One of the things that you notice about Schlumberger is um, the, the consistency of their performance and product on the product line is probably the tightest um, of the big three. Very tight concentric circle here um, in, in this premium quadrant space. In the Middle East, you find that they're extremely tight and consistent in the Middle East as well. If you take a look at SLB by product line in the offshore market here on the right-hand side of the screen, what you find is that SLB has a very tight consistency from product line to product line, as well as pretty much a pretty tight consistency in the international line market. You know, this comes into play when the, whenever SLB is competing for an integrated project internationally and offshore, regardless if they're integrating drilling, completions, production, or issue evaluation. Um, all of the data suggests that they have a very high consistency of performance from product line to product line, and as an operator, the probabilistic outcome is going to be fairly high. Um, although it may not be always be perfect, of course, because in the oil field services business, you know, things happen in the field. But statistically, uh, they look rather strong, particularly compared uh, to some of their key competitors, uh, Baker Hughes and Halliburton. And then turning our attention over to Weatherford. Uh, Weatherford has a little bit greater dispersion of performance and value globally. Um, internationally, Weatherford is very solidly positioned as a, as a value advantage discount provider. In North America, uh, their performance is viewed as being slightly below industry average with pricing that's generally on par with industry norm. Um, and so, you know, Weatherford has some very strong positions in North America with artificial lift. Um, they're not necessarily being viewed as a performance leader in all cases, but, but close to the fair value fairway. Just as a point of comparison, if you compare Weatherford on the left to SLB to the right, uh, you can see just a comparison difference between the two suppliers. By product line, uh, Weatherford is fairly consistently positioned as a discount uh, value advantage supplier across most of their product lines, with the exception of Rob Lift. Um, and if you look at their dispersion pattern of product lines uh, by region, offshore, international land, and, and North America land, you, know, you can see their dot plot. Um, and their dot plot has really improved over the last uh, few years and, and has really strengthened. Um, you can see here's their 21 dot plot and there's their uh, 2020 dot plot. So Weatherford is, is taking great strides to improve the consistency of the performance and the value that they deliver on the market today. 
And, and with that, we also see a very similar trend with Baker Hughes and Halliburton from 2020 to 21 to 22 with their dot plots. So in general, there's a couple of trends that we've seen in, in the market with the big four. Schlumberger or SLB, Halliburton, Baker Hughes, and Weatherford from 2020 to 21 to 22 have all taken a pragmatic look at their operations and they, they've all kind of exited product lines or geographic regions where they were struggling to perform consistently and to deliver good value. In, in all cases, all four of them have exhibited improvements in overall performance and value that they deliver in the regions and the product lines in which they operate in. As an oil company, I encourage you to, to reach out to the various oil field service providers that you use and collaborate with them, recognizing, as you saw here today, not all oil field service company suppliers are viewed as performing at the same level. Each oil field service company has particular strengths and weaknesses. And by partnering up and understanding the strengths and weaknesses, we can all get better aligned and continue to drive efficiencies for our industry. And just to kind of wrap things up here, unless there's some uh, questions that are coming in, um, I think a couple of things that we'd like to have you kind of think about for the rest to keep your eyes on for the rest of 2023 is that while market volatility will likely continue, there's all types of influences on the price of oil and geopolitics and such. It's very clear that from the previous years of underinvestment, there's a, there's a desire by the oil and gas operators to restore production capacity and, and, and to do it in a, in a very uh, environmentally responsive way with ESG on the forefront. Um, but it's also evident that capital discipline has set into the industry amongst the operators as well as oil field service companies. And so the industry is just not going to invest for the sake of growth or growth alone. And as a consequence, you know, the collaboration between oil field service providers and oil companies has become more paramount. Just like I shared with you earlier, the major oil companies and national oil companies seem to be emphasizing more on partnerships and access to quality service and the quality technology and equipment to allow the operators to be able to meet their growth uh, and investment plans moving forward. So um, with that, unless there's any other questions, I'd like to wrap it up. We try to keep these webinars uh, to about 30 minutes uh, to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, keep in mind, uh, we have comprehensive reports for the Permian Basin, Middle East, and we can prepare other reports as needed. Um, and I want to thank all the oil and gas operators that participate in our industry surveys. Uh, reach out if you have any questions or need access to any of the report summaries from any of the prior reports or prior webinars. And um, so thank you for attending today. Bye now.